When I was a boy, I was watching late night television once, and a comedian came on. His name was George Carlin, pretty funny guy. He did a sketch on the difference between football and baseball. George Carlin's dead now, but you can still watch that. That's pretty funny. I thought, well, this guy's funny. He, he did a sketch on religion one day. I thought, well, that will be interesting. And it was, but it wasn't funny. Here, here was George Carlin's take on religion, leaving out the profanity. He said, so here's the way it goes. There's this um, almighty being in the sky that you can't see, but he can see you. And he has 10 rules nobody can keep. And if you break the rules, he's going to send you to hell to burn forever and forever and forever. But he loves you. That was George Carlin's take on the gospel. Now you know why it isn't funny. He emphasized the wrath of God, but he didn't say anything about the main message of the Bible. I suppose we could give George Carlin a pass. He wasn't a believer. There's a young man in Michigan who was a pastor who should know better, who did a tour not too long ago called The Gods Are Not Angry. And a lot of what he said was true and good. And the questions that he asked, he didn't, he didn't affirm things that really weren't true. He just left a lot of things out. And his point was, the gods aren't angry with you. God isn't a wrathful God. But he, he said nothing about sin, and he distorted what the Bible said about Jesus. Now, Paul, the Apostle Paul in the Bible, and the Apostle John in the Bible, who wrote the book we're studying today, they were not unclear about the wrath of God. Today, in Re Revelation chapter 6, the second part of Revelation chapter 6, we have a shocking statement about the wrath of God. And it's embedded in a vivid narrative about something that's going to happen in the future. And God is so clear about it, and, and he inspired Paul through the Holy Spirit, the Apostle Paul, to write about the wrath of God in Romans. He inspired the Apostle John to write in a vivid way, in a concrete way, about the wrath of God in Revelation. We'll read that today and we'll talk about why it's good that these men were clear about the wrath of God. So let's take our Bibles now and let's read Revelation and all of chapter 6. We preach Revelation chapter 6 verses 1 through uh, 8 last week. Those were the four horsemen of the apocalypse, and not to confuse you, but the four of the, the four of the seven seals. We cover two more of the seven seals today. There's an interlude in chapter seven, next, the, the next time we preach on this text after uh, Christmas, and then the last of the seven seals in chapter eight. So in order for you to track with this, it'd be a great idea for you to, to, to read and study and write down questions ahead of time, and also maybe to take a look at notes online. Now we're reading Revelation chapter 6 and verse 1. Now I watched when the Lamb opened one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures say with a voice like thunder, come. And I looked and behold a white horse, and its rider had a bow, and a crown was given to him. And he came out conquering and to conquer. When he opened the second seal, I heard a second living creature say, Come. And out came another horse, bright red. Its rider was permitted to take peace from the earth, so that people would slay one another. And he was given a great sword. And he opened a third seal, and I heard a third living creature say, Come. And I looked, and behold, a black horse. And its rider had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard what seemed to be a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, a quart of wheat for a denarius and three quarts of barley for a denarius and do not harm the oil and wine. When he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creatures say, come. And I looked and behold, a pale horse and its rider's name was death. And Hades followed him and they were given authority over the, a fourth of the earth to kill with a sword and with famine and with pestilence by wild beasts in the earth. If you weren't here last week, you should probably go back and listen to that message to, to get the idea of what was going on here. But to give you just a kind of brief review, this is a, a description of a period of time in the future that Jesus talked about in uh, the Olivet Discourse that, that he called the tribulation. 
Uh, Luke called it the day of vengeance of our God. John is describing it here and using these uh, pictures of like horses and, and riders that when seals are broken in heaven, then things happen on the earth. In real time, in, in time and space history, in the future, Jesus will open this scroll, and when, the sea, and when each seal is broken, something is going to happen on the earth. And now we're up to the fifth seal in verse 9. And he opened the fifth seal. And I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness that they had borne. And they cried out with a loud voice, O oh, sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge your blood on those who dwell on the earth? Then they were each given a white robe and told to rest a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers should be complete who were to be killed as they themselves had been. And he opened the sixth seal. And I looked and behold, there was a great earthquake and the sun became black as sackcloth and the full moon became like blood and the stars of the sky fell to the earth as a fig tree sheds its winter fruit when shaken by a gale. And the sky vanished like a scroll that is being rolled up, and the, every mountain and island was removed from its place. Then the kings of the earth and the great ones and the generals and the rich and the powerful and everyone, slave and free, hid themselves in caves and among the rocks of the mountains, calling to the mountains and rocks, fall on us, hide us from the face of him who is seated on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come, and who can stand? Pray with me. Father, thank you for your word. We pray that you would help us to be among those who tremble at your word, as you said. And Lord, today as we study your word, I pray that you give us light and that you would stir our hearts to obey you and that you'd work by your Holy Spirit in us. And I also, to, to change us into your image, and I also pray for those who are here who are outside of Christ, though, though they may have made a profession or gone to church, they expose the hearts of those who, who really don't know the Lord and comfort the hearts of those who do and help us in this. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So there, are, so there is this uh, time on the earth when there will be a false peace promise, that's the white horse, and then it will be followed by war, the red horse, famine, the black horse, and death, the pale horse. And the, this is obviously a, a horrifying time on the earth. And then, and then there's a response to this. There's a, a res one response from heaven and one response from earth. Our text today is a response from heaven, the crying out of the martyrs whose blood is under the altar, and then the response from earth, the, the, uh, the crying out to the mountains of those who are experiencing the wrath of God. That's the text today. Verses 9 through 11, the martyrs cry out in heaven, and they cry out, avenge us, which is interesting. God, you saw what happened. So God, when are you going to make that right? When is justice going to come? When are you going to avenge our death? And God doesn't say, I'm not going to avenge your death. He just says, here, wait a little bit until your number is complete, and then I will thoroughly avenge your death. I'll pour out justice on the earth. And then the, in verses 12 through 17, the wrath is poured out on people that are called earth dwellers, dwellers upon the earth. And if you read through the Revelation, you watch for every time that occurs, earth dwellers, dwellers upon the earth, it's a, it's a technical reference. It's a special reference to those who are lost and in rebellion against God. Not just people who happen to be on the earth, but these people are called, those who are in rebellion against God, earth dwellers. And, and the wrath is poured out on those who dwell on the earth. And they cry out, not to God, but to the mountains, hide us. That's in verses 12 through 17. Let's go over that with a little bit more detail. We're now in the fifth seal, and we'll listen to the cry of the martyrs, and we'll ask, what does God want us to learn from the cry of the martyrs? What does it mean, the souls under the altar? What does that mean when he opened the fifth seal? I saw under the altar the souls of those who'd been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had borne. And this was obviously the altar of sacrifice. This is a it, 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 from the Old Testament, from the tabernacle and from the temple, the, the altar of sacrifice. And when the, a sacrifice was given and was acceptable to God and its blood was to go under the altar, this is to say these people have laid down their lives 
like a sacrifice to God. These martyrs have laid down their lives, and, this, and their lives were accepted by God. They were acceptable as a sacrifice. And so their cry triggers another wave of judgment on the earth. And they're given white robes, told to rest until their number is complete. And it's obvious that God is in control of their number, not the ones who oppress them. So think about this in, in concrete terms, what the Bible is teaching. Like in other parts of the Bible that give prophecies of the future that have happened and were fulfilled, when the prophecy was given, it was a, a prophecy for the future. And we can see some of those prophecies were fulfilled in the first advent, in the coming of Christ. And we know that they were fulfilled not figuratively, but literally. There may have been poetic language used, but real things happen in real time in space and history on the earth. So we know that's how we're to read Bible prophecy. So things are going to happen in the future in real time. Real time and space, things are going to happen on the earth. This is a description of things that are going to happen. So there is going to be a time on the earth of a great outpouring of God's wrath and of his justice. God's expressions of wrath vary in the Bible. There, there is an expression of God's wrath that's recorded by Paul in the first uh, chapter of Romans. And, and it's it, over and over, it says, I think three times, God gave them up, God gave them up, God gave them over. One of the ways God expresses his wrath, his just wrath, his, his justice on stubborn sinners is to turn them over to themselves. And thoughtful people today who observe what's happening in America often say God is giving America up to what America wants. And that's an evidence of the wrath of God. But it's not this kind of expression of wrath yet. This will be a concrete, observable, visible, bloody, deadly, frightening outpouring of God's wrath, real, in real time. This is what the, the Bible teaches, in not just in, in one or two places. What can we learn from the cry of the martyrs? This is interesting. When the martyrs cry out, we would call that praying, crying out to God in prayer. God acts on their behalf. This is not the first time we've seen this. The prayers of the saints are gathered in golden bowls, and God acts on the prayers of the saints. God acts on the prayers of the martyrs. God acts on our prayers. And it will be tempting for us to believe in hard times, in difficulty when our car isn't running, or we don't have a good job, or our boyfriend broke up with us, or girls don't like us, or, or we lose our job, or we're afraid everything's going to shut down, or the guy we voted for didn't get elected. It'd be tempted for us to think it, it doesn't pay, it doesn't work to trust God. It, it, it's, it's worthless to, to build my life on the promises of, of God's word. And what the word of God here is saying that the, the holy God of all of heaven, the sovereign God of everything acts when he's put into the hearts of, of the simplest teenage girl a prayer. And she prays to God and God acts on behalf of that teenage girl's prayer. Or that, or that martyr, that suffering martyr. This past week, I, because of the turning of the seasons and the cold weather, I had uh, instinct to uh, organize things. And so I decided to organize all my pens. And if you know me, I have hundreds more pens than I need. And, and I was organizing my pen. It really is bizarre, to be honest. But you have a collection like that, even if it's not pens. You know you do. Anyway, so I'm organizing my pens and I'm organizing my journals. When I'm organizing my journals, it's like going through old photographs. It's a chronicle of the faithfulness of God. It's a record of my desperate prayers. I pulled a, a journal down, black one with a red tape on the binding. It had been my journal in the early 90s. I was 37 when I made the particular entrance in my journal that I'm going to talk to you about right now. And it was a Saturday night. It was the eve of the Lord's Day. I needed to preach the next day. And I had lamented that I had failed in my thought life morally that week. I lamented that I couldn't get my cars fixed. I lamented that I couldn't get my lawnmower running. That I didn't have my taxes paid that bills hung over my head. And I was afraid 
that I wasn't going to be able to feed my kids. And I told God in my journal, I feel like I don't have much to say tomorrow. You're going to have to help me. Back when I was 37, I wrote that in my journal. And then I read that this week. That, that, that week, my car stopped running, and I didn't know how to fix it. And I figured it might be a bad fuel pump. It was just a guess. I'm really not good at things like that. I guessed it was a bad fuel pump. I called around. They said a fuel pump for that car was uh, about $360, the repair and the replacement. And, and, and that was a, over a week's pay. I, I wouldn't be able to come up with that money. I thought I have to fix it myself, but I don't even know where a fuel pump is. Is it in the engine? Is it somewhere along the body of the car? Is it in the gas tank? At the time, I didn't even know where the fuel pump was, what it looked like. I worked on that without success, and I prayed and asked God to help me. And I went to church, and a visitor was at church. God I'd never seen before, God I never saw again. In my sermon, I complained about not being able to fix my car. On the way out, the guy says to me, well, drop that tank. He says, it's in the tank. Just All you got to do is just drop the tank. And once you drop the tank, it's really obvious. It sits right on the top of the tank. You just turn it, you take it out, you replace it. It's really not a big deal. <laughs> I see you don't know me very well. Drop the tank? You got to take the gas tank off the car? What do you use to do that, and how do you not blow up? But I was a poor preacher, and I had no gas in my tank, so that helped. I was inspired. To, do you remember this? Lesson? I was inspired to go home and, and spend my day off on Monday dropping the tank. So I did. I just started taking things apart. Some of the things I took apart didn't need to be taken apart, but I just took things apart until the tank came down. And I looked, and sure enough, there was this thing in the tank that I turned, and it came out. And I went and bought another one for like 30-some dollars. And I came back, and I put it back in, and I put everything back. And late in the day, as the sun was going down, I stood behind the car, and I said, okay, Lord, try it and see if it works. I put gas in the tank. Try it and see if it works. She so turned the key, the car started. Today we have two people in our house. We have four cars. <laughs> they all start when you need them to start, and they have gas in the tank. And I'm here to tell you that God is faithful. And by the way, thank you for paying me. I appreciate that. I also wanted to mention that part. All right, God is the God who, in answer to a fallen, broken sinner's prayers, will send somebody along to say just the right thing at just the right time so that you'll... And, and if you're here and you're wondering if you can depend on God, I'm here to tell you, you can. Get out a journal and put your desperate, put your desperate prayers in that journal. Because someday you're going to look back and you're going to say, God answered that prayer. This is the heart of our church. How do we reach other people? We want to follow Jesus. And following Jesus means we, we invite others to follow Jesus. Where does that begin? If we want others to follow Jesus, when, you get, when I tell you the answer, you're going to go, oh, I knew that. Well, I would suggest if we want to win people to Christ, we start with pray, love. You catching where I'm going with this? Invite gospel conversation. The whole evangelistic program, the, the whole idea of how to reach others starts with pray. Like I dealt with a car salesman yesterday. He, he was a Michigan fan. He came over to my house to sign papers. He had his Hail to the Victor shirt on. And, and, I, I, and, and he said he's going over to his brother's house to watch the game last night. That was sad. But anyway, he, he went over to watch the game. And, 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 and when he left, I had him on my heart.
away from God and from his presence and from any hope of peace ever. Do you believe the Bible? This is what we're talking about here. So God, this is what we learned from the martyrs. You may lay down your life. You may die. God acts on behalf of those who pray. Now let's look at the sixth seal. There is this cry of the martyrs, and the lesson from the cry of the martyrs, pray. Don't harden yourself. Humble yourself and pray. And then there's this sixth seal that when the martyrs cry out for justice and for judgment and for God to avenge their death, he does. In verses 12 through 17, the lamb, God himself, breaks the the seal, the sixth seal. The seventh seal is in chapter 8 and verse 1. In this seal, cosmic disturbances come directly from God to earth, a great earthquake. The sun becomes black. The moon becomes like blood. The stars of heaven fall like figs, or there's a, an asteroid or, or meteor shower. The sky rolls back, and the mountains and the islands move. This is also described by Jesus in Matthew 24, verse 21, in the Olivet Discourse, when he said, then there will be a great tribulation such as not been since the beginning of the world until this time no nor ever shall be and i don't want to confuse you but there are good people who love the lord who understand revelation they don't understand the book of revelation as describing things that happen in the future they understand the book of revelation as describing things that happen in the past i respect those people but i don't agree with them and here is why because the language of revelation is is so over the top that the, the people who believe, some of them believe that obviously parts of Revelation are future, the return of Christ, but others actually believe, and a few, and they aren't orthodox, these people, actually believe that Jesus doesn't return, but these, these figures that are given that say Christ returns are other things that have happened in human history. Um, they're, they're not people we would consider Bible-believing Christians, but there are others who have a view that Revelation is describing either things that, are, uh, that, that happen in cycles all throughout time or the things that happen in the past, usually before the fall of Jerusalem in AD 70, and they have to kind of backdate or see the dating of Revelation different than most Bible scholars do. But lest I confuse you, here's why I believe that this is describing something future because the language is so over the top, just like what we read right here. It, listen to the language um, that, that's being used um, in this. I looked, behold, there was a great earthquake. Sun became black as sackcloth. Full moon became like blood. Stars fell to the earth like a fig tree sheds its winter fruit, shaken by a gale. The sky vanished like a scroll that's being rolled up. Every mountain and island was removed from its place. And the kings of the earth and the great ones and the generals and the rich and powerful and everyone slave and free hid themselves in caves among the rocks of the mountains, calling to the mountains and rocks, fall on us hot as from the face of him who's seated on the throne from the wrath of the Lamb. And in the parallel passage, Jesus is saying, this, there will be great tribulations such as not been since the beginning of the world until this time, nor ever shall be. And the rebels, they run for cover, and, in, and you'll see this consistently, when a person sets their heart in rebellion against God, they don't even pray to God. They don't cry out to God. These rebels cry out to the mountains and not to God. Does it ever amaze you that people, the, the things that people can go through and not ask God for help? Just stubborn. Just don't need God. Not going to talk to God. Not going to humble themselves. So if you, you don't get anything, if my message is confusing you today and you don't get anything else, I would, can, you, can I give you just kind of the heart of this? And that is, when you're going through tribulation of any kind, hardship, difficulty, temptation, don't harden yourself. Humble yourself before God. Don't harden yourself. Humble, humble yourself before God. And, and, and that's the lesson that we can learn from the chaos a rebel heart is hardened by God. In chapter 9, Revelation 9, 20, it says they did not repent. Revelation 16, 9, 
and 11 says, Men were scorched with a great heat and blasphemed the name of God who had power over these plagues and did not repent and did not give him glory. Verse 11, they blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and sores, and they would not repent of their evil deeds. What do we learn? Don't be, don't be, here's one thing we learn from this chaos on the earth. Don't be intimidated by great men of the earth. Don't put too much hope or confidence in great men or women of the earth. Don't, don't, don't hang your hopes on great men or, or women of the earth, but fear God. Have reverence and fear for the judge of all men. Pray to God. Cultivate the fear of God. I'll give you a little practical assignment or uh, exercise that would be extremely helpful. I've done this myself. It'll help you. Think about, ha- don't raise your hand, but I wonder if we did, how many of you would, would confess, I struggle with anxiety. Many, many Christian people wrestle with anxiety. And I want to give you a, an exercise that will help you if you struggle with anxiety based on what this passage is teaching us. And here, here's the idea. If we fear God, that will work against our fear of man or fear of anything else. So if we want to overcome the fear of man or fear or anxiety of anything else, we cultivate a fear of God. We don't think how things, so much how things can hurt us or how circumstances can hurt us or how people can harm us. We think, who is God? And what has he said that's always true? And so here's the exercise, and that is study your Bible, kind of like with a mental highlighter or with a real highlighter or with notes, and every time you can find it in the Bible, it's all over the Bible, write down the benefits of the fear of the Lord. What is the fear of the Lord? And what benefits do we get by living in the fear of the Lord? You'd be really surprised the powerful things that happen in us when we cultivate a fear of the Lord, a conscious Uh, understanding that we are going to stand before God, that all sin is going to be judged by God. And stay with me because we we haven't even gotten to the good part yet. So now why was this important to to the original audience? Because these people in these seven churches were facing persecution. And they were in a a minority. And they they were vulnerable to, uh, to death and to suffering and to poverty and to displacement and to being set aside. And their children were suffering. Their loved ones were suffering. And God says, your suffering has a shelf life. God sees and he will avenge your suffering. You can trust me. Fear me and you don't have to fear them. That's why it was important to the original audience. He was trying to give them great encouragement to be faithful and to persevere. How relevant is the Bible always to what we're going through? Leads us to the question, why is this important to us? And and in... Revelation fashion, I'm going to give you seven reasons why it's important. Let me give them to you quickly. I'll put these online this afternoon in case you don't take notes quickly enough and you're interested in looking back. Let me give you seven reasons why it's a good thing that God has warned us in such a stark way about his wrath. Track with me. George Carlin, not picking on the guy, he knows better now, mocked God in profane terms. He mocked the justice and the holy character of God. Rob Bell really did the same thing, hinting at, this is the pastor from Michigan I was talking about earlier, hinting that God really is going to just accept everyone, whether or not they believe in the shed blood of Jesus Christ as a sacrifice and atonement for their sin. He, he did a tour in which he talked for an hour and a half every place he stopped, And he said, the gods are not angry with you. And he never talked about guilt. And he never talked about sin. This is not the way Paul talks about the wrath of God. Not the way John talks about the wrath of God. And so what I'm saying is, in our culture, the air that we breathe in our culture is saying, talk about God being nice. Talk about God being loving. Talk about God being kind of like, you know, a benign kind of hippie-like pay-it-forward type. But don't talk about the wrath of God. I want to give you seven reasons why it's good to talk about the wrath of God. I want to read for a couple of times what it says here in their prayer. In Revelation 6, 16, it says they're calling to the mountains and saying, fall on us, hide us from the face of him who's seated on the throne. Who is that? 
That's God the Father. And from the wrath of little Jesus, meek and mild, who is the slain lamb, who is the coming king, who is also the God of wrath. For the great day of their wrath has come, and who can stand? Now, here are the seven things. Number one, a warning of the wrath of God is really an expression of great mercy. If the wrath is coming and you're not warned about it, there's no mercy in that. He, he, he could say to us, I spent 14 chapters of Revelation describing you exactly what I was going to do in the most stark and shocking terms. In the most concrete terms, I painted pictures. I made a movie for you. Then second, the warning of the wrath of God is assurance that our own longings for justice will someday be fully and finally satisfied. You and I have a longing for justice. Maybe for a loved one that's been hurt. Maybe for us or for others that we see in the world. God, are you going to let that happen and you're not going to make it right? And God says, no, my character is, is holy and perfect and I will satisfy my justice. So the warning of wrath is an assurance to us that our longing for justice will be satisfied fully and finally by God. We don't have to take vengeance upon ourselves. Third of seven, why is it good to study the wrath of God? Because a warning of God's wrath is a display of the character of God and of the depravity of men or the sinfulness of men. God is holier than you think, and you are more sinful than you think. And when we study the wrath of God, we see the, this, that gap more like God sees it. Our sinfulness is greater than we want to admit. We compare ourselves with one another instead of comparing ourselves with God. When we study the fear of the Lord, study the wrath of God, study the justice of God, then we see our own sin and we see God's great holiness. And I haven't gotten to the good part yet. Number four, warning of wrath is a reminder that we don't stand in judgment of God. God stands in judgment of us. Our culture is standing in judgment of God. Not being, not picking on these men, but the George Carlins of this world and the Rob Bells of this world are, are they are standing in judgment of God. It, preachers that get up and say, apologize for the Bible are standing in judgment of God. Your job isn't to apologize for the Bible, explain it away. It's your job is to proclaim the truth of it. It's true if the whole culture says that God and Jesus are not politically correct. They're correct. <laughs> they're right. They're righteous. So the wrath of God is just a reminder to us. You, you can say, well, I don't know if God should have done this. I don't know if God should have done that. I've heard even pastors uh, wrongly kind of say, well, if I wrote the Bible, I wouldn't have put that in it. Like someday you've got to face God with, and give an account for having said that about what God did and didn't put in the Bible. God isn't going to answer our questions. We're going to answer his questions. God isn't going to stand before us as, as judge. We're going, to, we're going to stand before him or someone is. And so uh, think about this just for a minute. Give you a couple of quick examples um, one example to study further, and we'll, we'll return to this someday, is look at the conversation between God and Job in this very regard. He, Job is asking God questions. He's peppering God with questions. He's got God on the stand. <laughs> and, and, and then Job 38, uh, 1, then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, who is this who darkens counsel by word without knowledge? Who's, who? Who are you to talk to me? Those ignorant things. God says to Job. Who is it who darkens counsel by word without knowledge? Now you prepare yourself like a man, and I will question you, and you will answer me. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? And then God explodes in a poetic, uh, an amazing poetic series of questions, which basically say to Job, sit down and be quiet. I will ask you questions you don't ask me questions. This is interesting to me because this isn't the only place in the Bible where you get to that spot where a person is going through intense difficulty and suffering says to God, God, I, I, why are you letting this happen to me? And I have questions for you. And God doesn't, doesn't answer him. God's answer to him isn't really so much an answer to his question as he just points to his own character. I'm God. Now, that's what he says to Job, and then God questions Job through chapter 40 and verse 2, and then Job offers a humble reply. I should have held my tongue, chapter 40 and verses 3 through 5. 
And then God continues his questions, and then Job responds meekly, and Job is a good model of this. This is exactly what happens in, in Romans, too, when, when there's a rhetorical question uh, posed by Paul in a difficult passage talking about, you, have you ever had a nice argument, maybe in Bible college or somewhere in Sunday school, about election or predestination or the sovereignty of God? And if you did, somebody turn to Romans and chapter 9, I'm sure, because Romans chapter 9 talks about the election and predestination and especially about the sovereignty of God. And, and Romans 9 affirms the sovereignty of God in, in election and such. And then verse 19, a rhetorical question, who will say to me then, why does he still find fault for who can resist his will? This rhetorical question is, well, if there's truth to this election thing, if there's truth to this divine sovereignty thing, then why would man have any responsibility? But the Bible consistently says man has a responsibility to believe. So the, the, the rhetorical question is given in verse 19. God, explain yourself. And listen to the answer in verse 20. It's the same as Job. Who are you, O man, to answer back to God? What, what Will what is molded say to its molder, why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable? What if God, etc. What if God, desiring to show his wrath and make known his power, endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? Now, don't get off in the tall weeds of election and predestination. We, we could do that another day. That's not my point. Here is my point. On a couple of occasions here, if you, you, you add Revelation, you have three examples that I'm giving you in the Bible this morning that, that when life is very, very hard, and I'm tempted to say to God, God, why are you letting me, why are you letting this happen to me? God's answer consistently is, I'm God. I'm God. It, it implied, I've given you enough, all you need to trust me. You build your life on that, you trust me, and you keep trusting me. Another way to say it would be your take home today. And that would be this. You, you're going through hardship. People in our church are going through terrible hardship. Our world, our nation is going through hardship. This is going to be the strangest holiday season any of us have ever gone through. We're going to be tempted to, to really be discouraged by it. And along with these churches and these little clusters of Christians in the early centuries of the church, we, we can do what they did and say, God, you've spoken and I will trust what you have spoken. I will not harden myself during these times. I will humble myself during these times. I will pray and I will trust you, God. So that was sick, a four, four. Uh, repeat, warning of wrath is an expression of God's mercy. Warning of wrath is the assurance that our longing for justice will be finally and fully satisfied someday. God giving us a warning of wrath is a reminder that we don't stand in judgment of God. He stands in judgment with us. One more thing while I'm ranting about this. Every once in a while, you'll hear a Christian who means well, maybe going through a very hard thing. I understand saying, I'm angry with God. Maybe you said that, I'm angry with God. My counsel is minority counsel, I, I imagine. I would just suggest that you don't be angry with God. I would just suggest that what you do is you say, God, I submit myself and humble myself before you. Though I don't fully understand, I trust that one day you will help, and I repent of this anger. A fellow was in my car. I saw him this week. Precious man. He came out to help me this week. And one night we were together and he was wrestling with, with difficulty in his life. And, and, he, and he, um, he, we were in my old red Jeep and he, he slammed his fist into the dashboard of my Jeep. And he, and he cursed God. I, I told him, don't, don't hit my Jeep ever again. And I said... I did. I said, don't, don't do that. Um, and then second, before you get out of my car, you need to ask God to forgive you for what you just said. It's all right if you pour out your heart to God and you tell God you're struggling with sin. I'm just telling you as a pastor, I would give you this suggestion. It's popular for people nowadays to say, I'm angry with God. This is the God of the universe we're talking about here. One day when you stand before God, 
your idea that you, you are confused about God's justice won't hold any weight before you stand before God. And I'm, and I'm not to the good part yet. So uh, warning of wrath is a reminder we, that we don't stand, we stay before God in judgment. He doesn't stand before us in judgment. Number five, the warning of wrath is also good because it's a motivation to escape to the blood of the lamb. This is the good part, okay? Are you ready? Stay with me. This is the good part. This is the whole idea. This is the part Rob Bell left out. He had to know what he was doing. This is the part George Carlin left out. Probably didn't know what he was doing. This is like when you give the, George Carlin gave truth about God. He's holy. He's invisible. He demands perfect justice. If you, if you disobey him, you go to hell. But he didn't say the main point of the whole Bible. But he sent his son, Jesus, who took the wrath of God upon himself. That if we believe in Jesus, our sins will be fully and finally and completely and thoroughly cleansed and washed. And we will never face the wrath of God. Now, that's something that we want to keep believing and tell other people. This is the answer to that victim mentality that we tend to, they're like, oh, I'm, I'm hurt. People have hurt me. Of course they have. The martyrs under the altar crying out to God were hurt. But God answered, God is perfectly just. So when we, so when we are victimized by terrible sin against us, God knows this. He's not done making this right. It, and even if we're lined up and accounted, like Paul said, like sheep for the slaughter, what are we? Victims? No. What are we? If we're lined up like sheep for the slaughter and we have been abused or we have been mistreated or we have been treated unjustly and we're lined up like sheep for the slaughter, what are we? According to Paul, we are more than conquerors. We're super conquerors through him who died for us through Jesus Christ. That's the answer to the victim mentality. We don't, we don't go through life saying, people have been unjust to me. We go through life saying, I trust the one who can make every injustice right and will. That's why it's good for us to study the wrath of God. Because to study the wrath of God is to study the justice of God. And so that's the good part. How do I escape the wrath of God? I'll give you a, a memory device. Five, nine, five, nine. Two times. Five, nine, five, nine. Listen to Revelation chapter 5 and verse 9. This is how we escape the wrath of God. It says this, And they sang a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll, open its seals. You were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. It was what? How do we escape the wrath of God? The blood of the Lamb. Five, nine. Romans chapter 5 and verse 9. Can you remember that? 5, 9, 5, 9. Listen to Romans 5, 9. Paul talked about the wrath of God regularly. And Paul, he says, Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more we are saved from the wrath of God. Don't go around the country saying God isn't angry. Go around the country saying God is angry against sin, and he sent his son to satisfy the justice of a holy God. People, will, if you tell them that there's no anger against your sin, their spirit, until it's seared against God's truth, will not believe it. Because they know they're guilty. You know you're guilty. I know I'm guilty. And the only way I'm going to be free from my guilt is the blood of the lamb who died in my place. It's so wonderful. That's the good news. Number six. The warning of the wrath is a reason to praise him. Reason to praise him. In Revelation, you'll notice that, that God and Jesus are praised because he created all things. That's in 5, 412, if I remember. Chapter 4, I believe verse 12 or 11. Probably 11 because maybe there isn't 12 and 4. Okay, so, so young people, look that up and figure that out. Is it in Romans 4, 11 or 412? He says he created all things. And so up in heaven, they're praising him because he created everything. We look out and we see creation, the turning of the seasons, the calling of the geese overhead, and we praise the God who made all of that stuff. But then there's something more, and that is they're praising Jesus who is slain for his redemptive work, for his ransoming people to God from every tribe and tongue and nation, and they're praising him for that. So they praise God in heaven for creating, God, for creating things, and they praise God in heaven for redeeming us. But you know what they praise him in heaven for? more than creation and more than redemption is justice. And we, we have time, but let me give, give you just a few uh, quickly look in chapter or listen 
to chapter 11 and verse 16. The 24 elders sitting on their thrones before God fall on their faces and worship and say, We give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, who is and was. For you have taken your great power, you've begun to reign. The nations raged, but your wrath came, and the time for the dead to be judged. And at the end of verse 18, the destroying the destroyers of the earth. They're praising him for his justice. In chapter 15 and verse 3, you see another example of the heavenly multitudes praising God for his justice. He conquered the beast there in chapter 15, verse 2. And then verse 3, they sang the song of Moses, the servant of God, the great song of the Lamb, saying, Great and amazing are your deeds, Lord God Almighty, just and true are your ways, King of the nations. Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? You alone are holy. All nations will come worship you. Your righteous acts have been revealed. They're praising him for his justice in chapter 16 and verse 5. Just are you, Holy One, who is and was, for you brought these judgments, for they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and you've given them blood to drink. That's what they deserve. And I heard the altar saying, yes, Lord God Almighty, just and true, true and just are your judgments. In heaven, they're praising God for his creation. They're praising Christ for his redemption, and they're continually praising God because in this future context because he makes every wrong right, every injustice right. That's number six. And there's a final one. The, the, the wrath, warning of wrath and study of wrath is good because it's a call, obviously, to compassion and to mission. God says, I want to warn you ahead of time in stark and frightening reality of this. That will motivate you to witness to that car salesman and see to it that you have given him the gospel. I, I'm a Baptist. Did you know that? I was, I was raised mostly in Baptist church. My mom has a Bible church background, and my, she was saved in a Bible church, and my dad uh, was saved because some crazy Baptist dudes got in his, up in his business. My sister Melanie, she's smaller than me, but she's my older sister, is here today. Uh, we were raised in a Christian home because Baptist people got in my dad's face, and they said, are you saved? Are you born again? They just got up in his business like that. And, and, you know, I just think one thing about, you know, I don't brag about being Baptist. You don't hear me do that a lot. Don't say it much. But one thing I thank God for, Baptist groups have been evangelistically aggressive. And I would just say, God help us to be evangelistically aggressive in our pluralistic age when people are saying it doesn't matter if you even believe anymore. Where are the missionaries and the soul winners and the people who still care? Your loved ones that are lost? Do you believe there's a heaven? Do you believe there's a hell? Do you believe that people, when they die without Christ, they'll perish in hell forever? Because if you don't, you don't believe the Bible. You can't cherry pick other parts of it. This, this warning of the wrath of God should stir us up. Lo Lois and I will talk about how we got saved. I, I got saved in family devotions. Lois got saved. At, at, a, at a church the night they showed the world's worst Christian movie that was ever made. It was just a horrible Christian movie. If you've ever seen it, it's just poorly done. The movie was called The Burning Hell. But my, 12, my wife now, who was 12 years old then, got saved because she didn't want to go to hell. Every once in a while she'll say to me, Ken, make sure that you warn people about hell. That's how I got saved. So I, you know, we talk a lot about it, and I've just gone on and on today, but Christians of Bethel, let's, let's be faithful to realize we have a mission, and let's have compassion on people, on our neighbors and others, and don't harden yourself, but humble yourself. When I, when I was a little boy, I, I, was, I was in family devotions, and when I realized the gospel, I understood my parents had described, my dad actually described it to me. I don't know if Melanie, you were there that night. Yeah, you were because dad was saying, you know, your sister's a Christian. <laughs> I'm a Christian. And then he kind of like looked at me like I was a pagan. And I was like, I'm going to heaven. And he's like, you know, like that. And I'm like, well, I know Melanie. And what's that about? Anyway, I remember that night my dad described the gospel to me. Uh, it was on, in a little house on Platt Street. It was west of 131 in Grand Rapids, across the street from a factory. We had a, an old couch, a scratchy old couch with those, with those little fibers woven in that looked like gold. Wonderful 
couch. I knelt down by that couch and just I did what my dad told me to do and I believed in Jesus and prayed and asking God, Jesus, to forgive me of my sins. And he saved me. But that's not when my testimony began. My testimony began years before that when there was a young man who, who had knew that he had a lustful heart. He knew that he had a deceitful heart. He knew that he'd hurt people and done things that were wrong. And he felt the guilt of that. He went home for a family funeral. His devout grandmother had died. She willed her Bible to him on the way back to Great Lakes Naval Air Station to join his buddy to the Navy in Newark, Ohio. He stopped at a bus station and he saw a book by Billy Graham called Peace with God. And he said, and he, whenever he gives his testimony, he says, he read the, what I'm going to read you right now, and it captured his heart and turned him to God. And he led us the Lord, mom, he and mom led us the Lord, and, and many others. And I just think, I want to read this to you before I close. Pronounce a benediction, and then challenge you to go out and find somebody who needs to know the good news and needs to have peace with God. This is what my dad read on that bus on the way back to Chicago that night. When his heart was so heavy, it turned him to God. A book by Billy Graham called Peace with God. You started on a great quest the moment you were born. It was many years, perhaps, before you realized it, before it became apparent that you were constantly searching, searching for something you never had, searching for something that was more important than anything in life. Sometimes you tried to forget about it. Sometimes you attempted to lose yourself in other things so there could be time and thought for nothing but the business at hand. Sometimes you may even have felt that you were freed from the need to go on seeking this nameless thing. At moments, you have almost been able to dismiss the quest completely. But always you've been caught up in it again. Always you've come back to your search. At the loneliest moments of your life, you looked at other men and women and wondered if they were seeking too. Something they couldn't describe, but knew they wanted, knew they needed. Some of them seemed to have found fulfillment in marriage or family living. Others went off to achieve fame or fortune in other parts of the world. Still others stayed home and prospered. And looking at them, you may have thought, these people are not on the great quest. These people have found their way. They knew what they wanted, and they've been able to grasp it. It's only, is it only I who travel this path that leads to nowhere? Is it only I who go on, goes on asking and seeking and stumbling along this dark, despairing road with no guidepost and the cry of mankind, but you are not alone. All mankind is traveling with you, for all mankind is on the same quest. All humanity is seeking the answer to the confusion, the moral sickness, the spiritual emptiness that oppresses the world. All mankind is crying out for guidance. All mankind is crying out for pe- comfort. All mankind is crying out for peace with God. So God's just wrath is against all in the world, but he sent his son, the Lord Jesus, to satisfy his wrath for those who will humble themselves and who will believe. Stand with me, please. I want to bless you on your way today with a, with a word of benediction. It's good to see you. We don't know what the future holds, and here we, we do know ultimately what the future holds. God, we thank you that you are not weak-willed and vacillating in the face of evil. We thank you that you not only pour out your perfect justice, but you sent your son Jesus to absorb your wrath, to satisfy your wrath. God, your anger isn't, isn't capricious. You're not personally irritated, not meeting out retribution for personal grievances, but you are the just judge of all humanity. And we acknowledge that today as we set beneath the teaching of your word, all that's wrong will one day be made right. Help us in the face of injustice, not to harden ourselves, but to humble ourselves and trust you that all that's wrong will one day be made right. Fill us with holy passion and resolve to make known to others the liberating truth of peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And help us, I pray, help your people that are here. They're your people. They have made an effort to come and worship you today. They have displayed in their behavior today that they're hungry for you, that they need you. So send them on their way blessed today, realizing that they, those who believe, are made right with God, and they have a message 
that they can share graciously with other people through acts of kindness and love and words of truth. And I pray that you would send our way people who need you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful day.